Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. And in this series of Seeking the Lord, we've seen that the presence of God is the key to everything. And if we can have the presence of God in our hearts and lives, then all, these, all the other things will be added to us. And the key, really, to, to coming into the presence of God more is to seek the Lord. And whether we realize it or not, we desperately need God's presence. Uh, we, we're like a car that needs petrol. Uh, it's like that we need the air we breathe. So we, are, we need God's presence if we are to function and be the person we're meant to be. That we are created to live by God's presence and for God's presence to fill us. Nothing will work right outside the presence of God. And the key to seeking God is to value God's presence highly. That's the real key. That if we value it highly, we will desire it. And this will motivate us to seek his presence more and more and to dwell in his presence. Because the heart always seeks what is of greatest value. Again, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's where your focus will be. That's where your attention, that's where your seeking will be. On that treasure, on the thing that you hold to be valuable. And so you'll necessarily desire and pursue that which is valuable. And so the great key is to know the full value of the presence of God. And then we will continually seek more of his presence. And Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. If we don't know its value, then we will seek answers and security and other things and they will always let us down. So we want to continue today to develop a bigger vision, build on what we said before uh, of the importance of the va- and the value of God's presence. And, and the way we're going to look at it this time is that, in fact, it's the presence of God that is the central theme of the whole Bible from the beginning to the end. That might seem like an outrageous statement, but we're going to show how that is the case. The whole Bible is all about how God made man to live in his presence originally, how God, how man lost the presence of God, and then how God has worked in history to restore man to God's presence through Jesus Christ, and how in eternity that will all be fulfilled. Let's go back to Genesis 3.1, where the problems began. Now the serpent, (coughs) Satan, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you will not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they both knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then we come to perhaps the key verse of the whole Bible, verse 8. It says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now here we see that Adam had many things. He had his beautiful Eve. He had the trees of the garden and all the wonderful uh, things there. Uh, But the most important thing that he had was the presence of God. The Lord God, it says, who was Jesus himself, actually, walked with him in the garden. And they walked and talked together. And Jesus appeared, as it were, as as a man. And he walked with in the presence of the Lord God. He had the presence of God. Man was made for the presence of God. And through the presence, walking and talking, Adam would have learned all that he needed to, to know about what to do and so on. And he would have had all kinds of wonderful joy in that presence. But, sadly, instead of abiding in God's presence, he was tempted to grasp after things, that forbidden thing, in lust. And by doing that, he lost the presence of God. 
And uh, then he started becoming self-conscious and he lacked security. He was afraid now. He felt the need now to clothe himself. He felt the need now. He lost his peace. He lost his inner joy because he lost the presence of God. He was no longer covered in the presence and the glory of God. And he lost the presence of God and he lost the outward things also because he was excluded from the garden and all the trees in the garden. And m many of the blessings he now lost because they came with the presence of God. But the most important thing that he lost was the presence of God. He was excluded from the garden. It says, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so <clears throat> man had fellowship with God in the presence of God. And that is what is, is, is the core of what, what man needed. And when Adam sinned because he tried to grasp after something else, he lost the presence of God. He died spiritually. You know, the presence of God goes right back to man's very nature of what he needs to exist. We're designed to live by the glory and the presence, the love of God. And as I've said before, as, as, as we receive the air we breathe, so our spiritual lungs, our heart is designed to receive the presence of God and, and that we function by that. We receive it, we breathe it in, and then we breathe it out as our worship to God. And in his presence, we come alive and, you know, we become what God wants us to be. And in the same way, by the way, God breathes in our worship and then and he breathes out his glory. We're meant to live with God, with the spirit of God flowing between us. In the beginning here, we see the temptation of Satan. How, what's Satan's method? What does Satan try and do to pull us out of the presence of God where he knows we then become vulnerable and come under his power. What he did is he tempted man to go after, to lust after, to seek after something else other than the presence of God. To seek the things, you know, that fruit. To look to the things for fulfillment, security and happiness. To, to give that happiness, to give that satisfaction, to give that wisdom, to know that to be like God, knowing between good and evil. And rather than looking to the presence of God for all of that, Satan tried to get man to look to those other things. Had they just stayed in the presence of God, God would have provided all the things they needed. But now, instead of trusting God's presence, Satan gets them to seek after the things and to look to those things for their meaning so that those things begin to rule their hearts. And so when we seek after things, the, what they offer to us is elusive and they don't deliver what, they, what Satan promises they'll deliver. They, they don't deliver happiness and satisfaction. But if we seek our happiness in the Lord, in his presence, we get the things as a byproduct of his presence. As the psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You see, as, as you delight, find your joy in the presence of God, the other things, the other desires of your heart that he will bring forth will be met also. Adam lost the presence of God and therefore he lost the things also. The more we seek after the things, because we think we will find our happiness and our security in those things, the more that will elude us. Because you can never have enough. You'll never have everything that you need it because they don't they can't deliver that for you you find your happiness in seeking the Lord and embracing the truth of who you are of who God made you to be you're not meant to be an independent soul you know n knowing the difference of right and wrong and and controlling yourself you're made to be dependent a creature dependent on God, on God's presence. And the more you embrace the reality of who you are, the more you will be filled with, with joy. And the more you will surrender to the presence of God. 
If we don't value his presence highly, and that's the problem with Adam, he didn't value the presence highly. He was, he was able to put that aside because he valued that forbidden fruit more highly, Adam and Eve did. And so if we don't value the presence of God highly, then we are very vulnerable to, for our hearts to be drawn away by something out there that seems beautiful, that seems good to the taste, that seems to offer us something. And we'll, we'll be willing to let go of the presence of God to have that thing or that person. And it's because we don't value the presence of God highly enough. But if we lose the presence of God, we will lose everything anyway. And in this fundamental story, we see the nature of sin, the terribleness of sin. Sin is to love a thing more than the presence of God, so that you move away from the presence of God to grasp it. It's a sin against the presence of God. It's, it's a relationship sin. The tragic consequence of sin is not that we break a rule and we lose some points with God that we can make up with some extra good works. But sin is far worse than that. It destroys our fellowship with God. It destroys the presence of God in our life. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It disconnects us from the glory of God. It cuts us off so that now we struggle in every area of life. God consciousness is replaced by sin consciousness and self-consciousness. We're aware now that something is wrong in the very heart of our being. We've lost the presence of God, the very thing that's essential to our life and well-being. Without the presence of God, man then was cursed to decay, to die spiritually, morally, intellectually, physically, because without God's presence, we're nothing. And man's answer to this terrible problem was brilliant, or rather, I should say, pathetic. It says, then the eyes of them were both open, they become self-conscious, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So here's aunt, God's, man's answer is fig leaf religion. It's a pathetic attempt to, to fix the problem. They're so aware of their nakedness, of their vulnerability. Without the presence of God, what do they do? They put some fig leaves together to cover themselves up. But it's just an external touch-up. It's, it's, it's what religion does. It's, I th man thinks by an act of piety, by doing some good works, by doing some rituals, that's going to buy God off. It's a superficial cover-up. Uh, it doesn't deal with the real problem. It's like putting a plaster on a tumour and, and thinking that somehow by covering it, I've dealt with it. But the problem is much deeper. It's the loss of God's presence due to sin. You can't fix it with a few good works. The real problem is not a loss of some points with God that you can make up with extra points as religions think about. It's deeper than that. We are now infected with, with sin something that is antithetical to the presence of God. And man is now lost in the spiritual darkness. He's cut off from the presence of God. He doesn't even know how to get back into the light of God's presence. He knows in his heart, he has an inkling, that he's made for something better. He's made for the glory of God, but he can't regain that lost paradise. And here's the central truth of the Bible, is that only God can restore man to God's presence. The way back into God's presence was by providing a perfect substitute and a perfect sacrifice through Christ. This is the way of salvation. And God, right there in Genesis 3, he introduced the way of salvation that he would provide for man to get back into the presence of God. He does it two ways in Genesis 3, but and this is really the whole rest of the Bible is all about this. How man can come back into the presence of God. That's the central theme of the, God, of the Bible. It's beyond the power of sinful man. Therefore, it must be by grace. It must be by God's initiative. And so God, first of all, announces that he's going to do this through a man, through a representative, through a champion. Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And this is the seed of the woman, the virgin-born Messiah. He will bruise your head, Satan, and you will bruise his heel. And it describes the fact that there will be this champion who is a man, 
but also as virgin born he will be the son of God he will be the God man and this Redeemer is going to do what's necessary to restore the, pre the presence of God to man and he's going to suffer and be receive our sin his he will be um, bruised he, he will be killed but also he will crush the head of Satan and the power of sin will be broken and man will be able to be restored to the presence of God and then 20, verse 21 shows how this will happen it says for Adam and his wife the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them so basically he's saying T for goodness sake Adam take off your fig leaves forget that notice Adam and Eve received the covering that was the first animal sacrifice in the Bible blood was shed of an innocent substitute and Adam and Eve were offered the clothes that God made for them uh, and that was a picture of Christ dying for us his death and if we accept him we are clothed in his robe of righteousness and God taught mankind right from the beginning that forgiveness of sins restoration to the presence of God is only possible through the shedding of blood and Adam and Eve will be in heaven because they received the robe of righteousness that God offered so God taught that forgiveness and access to God's presence is only possible through the shedding of innocent blood if we'll accept his sacrifice for us then we will be dressed in the robe of righteousness we will be able to come into his presence this was just a picture of what God was going to do because Adam was still excluded from the garden but Adam and Eve received the promise of it of what God would do and so they they will that will happen for them in fact it has happened when Christ rose from the dead they were restored into the presence of God but at that point it had not been accomplished and then throughout the whole Old Testament sacrifice system the same message animal sacrifices had to be male talking about that because the champion would be a man it must be a, a young male a young man it says without blemish he must be sinless that's why he was born of a virgin and all the animal sacrifices pointed to the perfect sinless substitute who must be a man to pay for a man but he must also be God because only God could have the infinite value in his blood to pay for the sins of the whole world so he must be the perfect God man and this is talking about Jesus of course Jesus came as the fulfillment he opened up the way back into God's presence by being our sinless substitute by becoming our righteousness by becoming our mediator between God and man and that's why Jesus said I am the way I'm the way the truth and the life and this way back into God's presence was pictured by the torn veil of the temple the temple you see represents God dwelling among men and the Holy of Holies is the presence of God the throne of God and so God was saying when that when that veil was torn he was saying that every barrier in God's heart that would keep man away from his presence has, has, has now been removed that barrier caused by our sin has now been removed and God's righteous judgment against sin was poured out on Christ so that sin issue has been dealt with and so God is saying now my heart is wide open as the way was now open into the Holy of Holies my heart is now wide open for you to receive you into my presence the way is open through that sacrifice to come in and, and the Old Testament showed that it's through the sacrifice that they could come into the presence of God now Jesus has made the final sacrifice the way now is open for us every moment of the day we can come into God's presence it is accomplished Jesus cried out and now it's accomplished we just have to trust him take him at his word receive his gift of righteousness that in Christ now we are righteous and we are able to come into the presence of God he's dealt with the sin problem so now we can boldly enter into his presence with thanksgiving and praise we offer up the we don't offer up a blood sacrifice anymore but we offer up uh, 
the, our thanksgiving for the blood sacrifice, offering up sacrifices of thanksgiving. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We acknowledge the value of his presence to us. Lord, you're my healer, you're my righteousness, you're my sanctifier. You are, the, you are all these things for us. And I, I have the presence of God. I thank you for the presence of God. I thank you that I can come into your presence. And your presence is valuable to me because it's purchased by the blood of Jesus. We, by thanksgiving, we come into the presence of God by acknowledging the sacrifice for us. Now that the way's been opened back into God's presence, God's done everything he can. Now it's up to us to seek his presence, to press into his presence with praise and thanksgiving. We take what he's done by the blood and we, we, we speak it with our lips and we thank him for it and we come into his presence with boldness. And how much we run into his presence and how much his presence comes out into us, it's up to us. The way is open. We have to just receive as a free gift. You know, even if you feel guilty, even if you feel bad, you can still come into the presence of God by trusting in the righteousness of Jesus. I, we don't come in our own righteousness. We come in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he's fixed the sin problem. And in his presence, he can sort out your rubbish. He can sort you out. The way of man is, oh, I'll sort myself out first. I'll clean myself up. I'll make myself acceptable. Then I'll come into God's presence. That will never work. You're too messed up to sort yourself out. You come into God's presence on the basis of, of his righteousness and in his presence, he, his beautiful presence, he will sort you out. That's how it works. We enter in through praise and thanksgiving. We use our words. Our mouth and our heart are connected. You know, number one, the mouth is the loudspeaker of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It expresses the heart. But also, number two, the mouth leads the heart. So what we say directs our consciousness. It directs our thoughts. It directs our heart. So our tongue is, is our tool by which we, we operate our dominion. We express our dominion over ourselves especially. So as you thank God, as you put appreciation and value on God and his presence and his blood, your heart then focuses in on your words and follows your words. So as you move your words towards God, you move your heart toward God. You move your presence toward God and you enter his presence, therefore, by praise and thanksgiving. By saying those words, you're commanding your consciousness towards God's presence. See, the sin problem's dealt with now in Christ. So now it's just an issue of your choice whether you'll do that or not. When you enter his presence, his presence enters into you and starts filling your heart. He has sought us. He's opened the way into his presence. Now it's up to us to seek him. How do we do it? With our mouth. Psalm 105, oh give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of his wondrous works, glory in his hope, holy name. Don't wait to feel inspired, move your mouth toward God and your heart will start moving toward God and your heart will then start rejoicing in his presence as his presence comes into your heart. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. You see, when you do seek God, your heart will start to rejoice because you'll start seeing everything in a new light. You'll start seeing things as God sees things. You'll hear the song of heaven and you'll start to sing in harmony. See, God sings the melody in his presence and then we hear it and we start singing the melody. We have to surrender to his presence. You'll, you will enjoy, there's no, if there's no joy in your life, it's because there's very little presence of God in your life and that's because you've done very little seeking of God in your life because you're seeking everything else to try and the things in this world to try and secure your life. Seek the Lord, it says. Seek his presence and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. As you seek his face, as you seek his presence, you'll also receive his strength, his life coming into you. We can trust him with all our heart. We can abandon all fear and self-consciousness. We can learn to release ourselves fully into his hands. Trust because we believe that he's sorted the sin problem once and for all. 
as we put our soul into, it, into his hands, he welcomes us into his presence and we come into that secret place and we can learn to abide there and, and remain there by putting all our trust in him and what he's done in Christ and by placing all our love upon him. To abide there is to rest our consciousness in his presence. And so we've seen the presence of God is the issue right at the start of the Bible. How does the Bible finish? By man being totally restored into God's presence in heaven for all eternity. I saw a new heaven and new earth for the first heaven and first earth passed away. There was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, will be with God forever. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle, the dwelling, the presence of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, sorrow, crying. There'll be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said, it is done, the sin problem is sorted. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And so now God offers his presence to us on a free will, free gift basis. And in eternity, we will be swimming in the presence of God forever and ever. It's a wonderful story. The whole Bible is about the presence of God. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our vision is to spread the in-depth teaching of the Word of God to the ends of the earth, but we need your help. If you can partner with us or, or pray for us, or contribute to us, it will make all the difference to make this possible. We all want to grow up spiritually. We don't want to stay babies, do we? We want to become men and women, giants of God even. And so that doesn't happen by accident. That happens on purpose. In my book, Growing Up Spiritually, I show you how you, you can become that strong man, that strong woman of God. The presence of God will do that in you. And uh, connected with that is Paul's teaching on Philippians. And I've I've started this series on Philippians, there's eight CDs here, that through Paul sharing his heart like in no other letter, he shows his relationship with God, and it's to inspire us into that same kind of relationship. So I'd encourage you, open up the book of Philippians with me. You can watch more of our teachings on our Oxford Bible Church Roku channel and Derek Walker YouTube channel. You're most welcome to join us at our church services which are every Sunday at 11am and 6pm at Cheney School, Headington, Oxford. You can order CDs, DVDs, books and other great products from our online shop at www.oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk or by calling 01865 515 086.